Hi and welcome to episode 14 of the Comedy Defect Podcast. My name is Winter Fonander, I'm a comedian and again the host of the show. This episode we have is with a very self-effacing, very self-deprecating, very low energy Mr. Tom Mayhew. Now Tom does a podcast with Paul Foote as well, but he is a very funny comedian in his own right. Great material, really solid performer and not what you'd expect because usually everyone's just trying to be flashy and, and high energy and, and big front, big bravado, but Tom is the complete opposite opposite to that, so it's wonderful to watch someone who's low energy on a different level do really well. It just shows you what you can do with comedy if you just be yourself. Just gotta be honest. If you've noticed in these intros, I haven't managed to put any of my life in the intro, so I don't know if you're happy about that, maybe you're not happy about it, maybe you are happy about it, maybe you just want to get on with the interview, that is fine. But I've been so busy at the moment, trying to get ready for weddings and everything, so I'm trying to get all these recorded and get my stuff together, and so I can get off and have a nice wedding and not stress about leaving something behind. So if you want to follow this podcast, you can, and we're on Twitter, at The Comedy Defect. If you want to follow me, it's at Winter Under. If you want to come see me live after the middle of September, it'll be uh, on my website, which is Winter Phone Under. Com. If you want to donate to this podcast, hey, soon it'll be a, a wedding present. Why not? You can find us on Patreon. We're there. Type in the Comedy Defect Podcast into Patreon and you can donate as much or as little as you want. If you don't want to donate, that's fine. But if you want to kick something back to us and you can't afford it, just leave us a nice review on iTunes or Podbean because that really helps, guys. It does. I say it before, I say it really does help. But that's all I'm going to say for this intro. I'm going to introduce you now to the wonderful, the very self deprecating Mr. Tom Mayhew. So, hey Tom, how you doing? You alright? I'm alright, yeah. yeah. I'm good, yeah. What have you got to? Um, not much, really. I've just been doing some gigs, doing some previews for Edinburgh, oh, things yeah? like that. Yeah. And how is that going? It's going very well. It's been lots of fun. I'm enjoying it. It's good. Mm. Yeah, it's good. Are you doing Edinburgh? Not this year. I'm, get, I'm getting married. This is going to be a recurring theme now. Oh. Um, not, 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 so I'm getting married this year, so I can't. I've heard a couple of people say this, and I would just say, get married to comedy. I'm already married to comedy. Well, uh, my, 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 my marry that instead in Edinburgh. Forget y- your wife. Yeah. And just marry comedy, mm-hmm. and you'll be happy. <laughs> yeah, but the thing is, you can't really love <laughs> sex with comedy. Is just a bit. It's a bit depressing, isn't it? It's a bit sad. It is, you know? but it's funnier. <laughs> I guess so. Well, that's happy, really happiness is not as funny. You have to be really sad, really upset, really lonely, and then you're a great comedian. No, I mean, I'm not going to do, like, material about, you know, my wife and, like, kids and all that kind of stuff, and I don't think happiness is ever going to be an issue. Everyone says that, like, before no. they get married and they end up doing it. No, I, I really don't think it's going to happen. I mean, yeah. I, there will be, like, you know, normal jokes, little lines about it, but not an entire fringe show about the cake or, okay. you know, or, or you know how the the arrangements of, 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 of the wedding and how she likes to plan it. It's not going to be like that. Okay, that's good. Because it's, it, there was nothing funny about that, because I'm sure that that wouldn't... No, it's marriage, tedious and boring. Exactly, and my marriage wouldn't last very long if I did a show like that, because she'd be like, oh, well, I did all the preparations, so what the fuck are you talking about? Oh, there we go, yeah. <laughs> yeah well, that's it, well, why I just went married. Then, if that ruins your marriage, that's your show for next year, sorted. My April yeah. show ruined my marriage by winter phone under. That's true, that's true. I'd go see um, that. Yeah. Uh, just, I'm I mean, not saying you should definitely do it. Cause I'm that's, just saying that I would see it. Yeah, that, okay, all right. So well, I've got one person coming to my yeah, show. That's good. And that, that's what we want, just comedians coming to my show. That's I don't what want you a mean. real audience. <laughs> <laughs> so we just pass the bucket round. Uh, yeah, you, can, you can pay me back when you come see my show. Oh, that's fine then. That's exactly. Good, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> but I mean, that show would be filled with uh, bitterness, um, anger, and despair. Um, so I mean, everything that everyone wants to see, they don't want to see it. So on a happy exactly, yeah. I mean, it would have a, a sort, a decent arc to it. Are you doing a full hour? No, no. Oh, I just kicked the microphone. No, no, I'm not doing a full hour. Uh, it's sort of like a split show. Mm. It's me and the brilliant comedian Adele Cliff, uh, mm-hmm. sort of doing 20 minutes each, and there's guest spots doing 10 minutes. Great. So it's about 50 minutes overall. Mm-hmm. So yeah. you can like barter with like you do a bit of my show, I can do a bit in your show, sort of thing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so it should be quite nice. Mm-hmm. I mean, it'll keep it a bit fresh, having different people each day mm-hmm. instead of just the same thing every day. You think, mm-hmm. Oh, we've seen all of this. It makes it a bit more exciting. Yeah, for sure, because you don't know how the opener is going to go. Exactly. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> hey, a risk. It's a risk. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, nice. yeah. It adds a bit of jeopardy into mm-hmm. it, which is what we need in our in our fringe show. Sure. <laughs> 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 what, what the venue? What's the venue you got? It's the Three Sisters Marquee with Love and Horse. Oh, yeah. Uh, it's like a little tent. Oh, the, the yurt. Yeah, I think it was called the yurt last year, but they've changed the name this year or something oh, okay. like that. Um, yeah. But that's our, that's our little venue at 10pm. Mm. This is useless now, because this is going out after Edinburgh. 
No, but they can if see, you could travel back in time, people think can show. People they can see it and go, oh, no, I saw him there. Oh, yeah, that was Tom Mayhew. Oh, oh Tom Mayhew's on the podcast. Yeah, yeah that's it. I was, I was the really sad, lonely guy. <laughs> you remember me, yeah. Oh, but that's a great spot, though, because everyone just keeps walking into there, isn't it? Oh, it's, it's nice fantastic. Thing. There's lots of, um, lots of passing audience, you know. It's, mm. The free system is always so busy all through mm. the day, so it, it should be... It should be good. It should, yeah, we should have at least an audience. Yeah, that'd be nice. Yeah, that would be nice. Yeah, <laughs> it's kind of ideal, isn't that's it? What, that's what you need for a show, really. You know, the, it's uh, yeah. it doesn't live without audience, does it? Really, otherwise, it just lives in your mind. You're like, is this is this real? <laughs> yeah, is this yeah. happening? Ideally, you'd want an audience there. Did, did I write that? You know, sometimes you ever dreams about like doing a gig or something, and you're there and at the show and it's gone really well and. I mean, that does happen in real life as well. But it does it? Y- yeah, I think occasionally. <laughs> <laughs> no, it does every now and then. What's the um, the most poorly attended gig you've ever done? Oh, Jesus, um, I'm sure it'd be. It's one I did recently in Hammersmith. Yeah, you don't have to say the name of the gig. No, I don't. I do not. I'm not saying anything. And it was. <laughs> okay. um, and it was I was invited in, down to show me it, so it was, I know not to email. <laughs> It was, um, it was, I was emceeing it. Okay. So it was your fault? Uh, no, it, no was... it wasn't my fault. It wasn't my night. So I was okay, like, right. uh, and there was like, I think it was one person in, in, at the very beginning and just comedians. Right. And I was like, oh, okay, getting some energy going. And, uh, there was one of the co- comics in the, in, in the crowd said to me, oh, hey, why don't you just talk to the comedians? I was like, okay. So I tried to talk to the person. And as soon as I tried to talk to the comedian, they just climbed up completely. <laughs> you know? Oh, dear. As a comic, when you're sitting in the crowd, you don't really want to be talked to. You want no, to just I hate go it. through your set, relax, and, and they didn't, they, this person thought, oh, it's going to be easy, just talk to the cop. No, that's not how it works. No, that's... They're not a real person anymore. You are, you are bent out of shape. You're, you're, yeah. you're, you're half a person. You're dead inside. No, it's like, yeah, when I do a gig, and if I'm wanting the first half, like someone I know who's always been might go up and go, hey, tell me right, I'm just like, Oh yeah, I'm fine. She did to go over my set, and yeah. then after I've been on to my set, I'm like, "Hey, you're all right." Before you've done your set, you're so mm. focused on it, and mm. you're in your own little world, and you don't want to chat to anyone. You That's want to just think, "Okay, I'll do this joke here, this joke here. Should I do this new bit? I don't know." You just mm-hmm. want to focus on that, don't you? Yeah, you don't want to. You don't want to get people distracting you and off your, you know, put put you off your game. But yeah, so I was, I was doing that, and that was pretty horrendous. I mean, I put every bit of energy I had into it, yeah. trying to, and I, I made it work. And, and then finally, this one guy was feeling really self-conscious because he was the only audience there. I said, let's just talk to you. And then he was like, okay, I don't, I don't really talk to you anymore. And then I was like, okay, look, I'm going to not ruin the, the tiniest amount of goodwill we've got in this room. Yeah. So, second, second, third act came on. There was two other people came, turned up. And they were really nice, actually. Oh, so it changed yeah. the whole dynamic, you know. And it, three's a crowd. You had three people, yep. and that was the crowd. You had a and crowd. That, and that made the, the whole night move a lot better, a lot easier. But it was one of those nights when you're like, okay, as an MC tonight, there's no way I can be funny. I'm mm. just going to be stupid and uh, yeah. and get the acts on and keep the energy up and sort of, you know. But it was just, yeah, it was one of those. Yeah, you're never you're never going to smash it on those nights. You're like, oh yeah, yeah. I'm going to smash. I'm just going to be the master of ceremonies tonight and just yeah. make everything, make everyone calm and relaxed. That's that's the right way of playing mm. it, I think. You're not thinking too hard about, oh, I've got to make those people laugh because there's, there's no point worrying mm. too much about it, is yeah. there? I, I did a gig in Taunton about about a month ago, and it was an interesting gig. It was in a, a place uh, just just you go into Taunton. It's just on the right in this pub, and it was full. They do curry and comedy there. Oh, and nice. it was a really it was a really nice room. And I played it about three years ago, and they moved the, they moved the setup because they had a, they bolted the door the last, yeah. the last time. Yeah, I was there, and I was like, oh, it's a bit kind of you know, no one's leaving. You're staying here for the comedy. You're, no one is leaving. It's a bit, bit imposing. Mm. I went on stage, I was emceeing, and I did a couple of jokes. They, they were like, you know, just kind of saying, look, I've got jokes, I can be funny. Mm. And then you're like, okay, they wanted some interaction. I was like, okay, fine, I'll do the interaction. But you know sometimes when you, you do a joke and you feel that you've got them, and you're like, you, yeah. you can steer them, like a one, like one person. Like, you know, you just, you're mm. driving this audience to where you want them to go. Yeah. But there was never a moment when I was on stage emceeing that gig when you felt that you were steering them. It was like, it was like a... a a captain's ship wheel, you know, and you're like, yeah, every time you yeah, grabbed I it, see, yeah. the handle will break off in your hand. Right. And you're kind of like, okay, where's this going? They want, they want interaction, but they don't, they want me to, to not do any, any material. So I was like, mm-hmm. fine, let's go with this. All right. So I was just the, the dancing monkey, just messing about and having fun with it. Yeah. They said, they said, came up to me afterwards and said, 
oh, you know, the guy that was on the week before you just really wasn't funny. I said, you guys are a hard crowd, you know, you should yeah. give him a bit of a break. You, you guys yeah. are not easy at all. I mean, you had to just kind of pull out all the stops and go for it, you know? Yeah, completely. Do you get free curry? Mm-hmm. Mm. And that's why you do it, isn't it? That's I said, just do it for the food. Nice. Good for the free food, but, you know, it's a long way to Taunton. <laughs> but, um, is it worth it? Is it a good curry? It is a good gig, to be fair. It is a good gig. I mean, we made it work, and it was just it was a lot of fun. Oh, nice. Um, and what's been happening in the life of Tom, apart from, you know, comedy? Or, I mean, you living at home, right? I live at home, yeah, with my parents. And how, how is that going? Like everyone of my generation. Um, I should say I'm like 24. So You've got a big house. Uh, <laughs> well, it's, it's fairly big. It's, it's rented. We don't own it. But it was, everyone of your generation. Yeah, everyone of every, every, generation has yeah. well, Most of my friends from school would actually for their parents still because yeah. houses are expensive and there's not much money around for us. I mean, you live in train. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, if you, people want to nail down my exact location. And I'm not going to give you your exact location, like postcode and all that. B6. <laughs> that's, not, that's not even. That's not even. Mm. But yes, I live with my parents. Uh, how old are your parents? 50s, 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 right? 50s. Do I have to specify? Do I have to to? Do you want the date of birth, Winter? Do you know what? I'm okay for the date of birth, but roughly, roughly, you know. Uh, Yeah, sort of um, early 50s, early 50s, yeah. 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 Were they playing football with you and stuff? Did your dad play football or? No, not really, no. No, sadly, we don't play football much, no. No. Well, what's what's the sport then? We would watch it. I think it's quite posh, though, isn't it? It's fairly posh. I guess it's it's quite a, a middle class town, and it's quite close to London. Is it box? Is it box or uh, Hertfordshire? It's still Hertfordshire, right? Still Hertfordshire, Hertfordshire right? Yes, yeah. which is a very very posh town to be part of. Yes, it's very nice. Yeah, um, it's, not, no, it's no St Albans as uh, Chris Norton Walker would say, but you know, hey, no, it is no St Albans. Mm. That's very true. Or Burko. Oh, Burko! I love Burko. Mm. It's, it's such a posh area that I call it Burko. <laughs> and you got like I went to Tring Museum. Oh, it's fantastic. Mm. There's a lot of. Uh, a lot of emus. Yeah? It's like, I, I think I counted about about 16 emus in that museum. I was like, whoa, they've really got a, a lot. <laughs> they've, got, they've got a hell of a lot. They've got a like, dungaree, I'm just saying, well, it's a, been a day here. De- like, um, they've got like a, uh, they've just got so many emus in that, in stuffed emus. They've got like about, I think about, yeah, about 12 or 16. I was like, yeah. there's another emu. How many emus? Are all different sizes? They're not all the same size. And, you know... Oh, a small emu, big emu, yeah. you know? It's, it's and Rod Hall was nowhere to be seen. No, it wasn't. It wasn't, no. As a reference, I can't really make it. I don't even know who he is. I just see, see, the, e- see the emu one? I think he was, yeah. Oh, who's the one with the green bird? Oh, uh, Orville and... Uh, I know who you mean, though. Yeah, I don't think he did Orville, did he? Orville no, was, no, was, was it Rod Hall and the emu? Emu was a pothole, yet. Yeah. I've not even seen it, it's yeah. just something I have in the back of my head. No, that's, you, you nailed it. Fantastic. You nailed it. But, uh, but Stand innovation from the audience. That's it. <laughs> well, <laughs> Stand innovation from all the audience who are over 40. Who <laughs> would get the reference. But, but I think Orville, I found, was a bit, is a bit weird, creepy, wasn't it, really? A, a, a duck in a nappy. Yeah. Uh, and also, yeah, oh, a bright green duck as well. I can't remember his name now, but the guy who did that, he used to do the like, adult shows where he would do, um, like, I think it was him, like Dirty Orville, he'd like swear and stuff and do all sorts of rude jokes with Orville. Right. Which yeah, is yeah. Weird. <laughs> I guess he's got both areas covered then, isn't he? Eh? Yeah, yeah. Well, there, there, must, there must be, you know, there must be an audience whose kids would love Orville and then the parents would sort of enjoy seeing the little kids toy go, oh, fuck this, or whatever it did, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah, that, well, he wasn't there. Okay. But, um, yeah, Tring. So, uh, you, you went to school in Tring as well? I did, yeah. Yeah, and, like, so when did you, uh, decide to do comedy? Do you mean when did I start, or when did I decide I wanted to do comedy? Decide. Or, oh. or both, or even. Or which oh. one comes first, dude? Do you just, like, fall into it and go, well, you know what, oh, one stage wants to do some comedy now? No, no, I, I, like, you occasionally hear people like that who are like, ah, oh, I never wanted to do comedy, I did it as a joke, or mm. I wanted to just do it once, but I've always sort of wanted to to be a comedian is mm. like, since I was about 13 I was mm. like it was like the, fir- the first time in my life that there was a job that I was like no that's what I want to do mm. like everyone was like oh I want to be an engineer since they were 10 or whatever and I was like I never really knew until I was like oh that would be really cool that would mm. be really fun and so since I was about 13 I was like yeah I want to be a comedian I did my first gig when I was about 18 but then I didn't gig for about 4 years t- till I started gigging regularly mm. um, so I probably started gigging regularly in 2014, I think. Right. Yeah, I think that's right. Mm. I think because um, I just didn't have the money when I was 18. <laughs> yeah, well, or probably it was. I probably didn't have the confidence either. You need to sort of grow as a person. Mm. You're probably ready for 
the ups and downs of stand up, you know. Yeah. And uh, and the travelling as well, you know, you've got to pay yeah. for the travel, isn't it? Yeah, I, I get trains a lot of the place because I don't currently drive. Mm. Um, and that costs a lot of money. It does, it does, man. It really takes it out of you. Yeah, it's expensive mm. to get the train and. Are you getting your licence or are you gonna. I, um, I hope to, I've got provisional, mm. um, but it's just having the money to afford a car, really. Yeah, that's um, expensive too. Yeah? Yeah, all that's up, man. You've got a car. I do, I do, and it's, it's I've got. I've How got much a, did it cost you? It, uh, you don't mind saying. I know it's a mine, it was, it was, it was pretty cheap, it was very cheap, but I got paid uh, 2000 for it. Okay, that's not too bad. It's not bad, but like, it was one of those cars that was like, oh, you know, a friend got it for me, and it was fine. Yeah. But it's got a big scratch down one side. Yeah. And I think that's why I got it cheap. Mm-hmm. And it's a, a Golf, but it's the fastest car I've ever had. And it is, it goes fast. A Golf is the fastest yeah, car you've I know, ever had. I know, what I know. cars did you have before? Um, I had a, a, what did I have? Oh, I had a Golf, another Golf, but it was a diesel. Uh, nice. I, I had a 1.9 litre diesel, which was a tractor. You had to make appointments to, to overtake anything. It was a tractor? Well, because it was, because it was, there was no turbo, it was just like a, you know, bog standard 1.9 diesel. Oh, so you weren't actually driving a tractor? No, but it felt like a tractor when you overtook something, because it was take, there was no takeoff on it, but it was so economical. Yeah. And that was 96 model, so nice. I had that for six years, that was my first car. But I had to get rid of that, because it was just like, you know, junkyard wars at this stage. You know, things would fall off. I'd have yeah. to repair them. It was great. It was a great learning car. You know, it was like, oh, Lego. Okay, well, the uh, alternator oh. was gone. Oh, I'll put this on, and it was great. But I'd love to drive a Lego car. It felt like a Lego car at the end of it. An actual Lego car, with an actual motor. Yeah, but imagine getting hit by a Lego car. It'd be kind of painful, wouldn't it? Get like corners, yeah. corners. You know, I guess you could get a nice round corner as well. I mean, I'll be honest. When I when I'm choosing what car I would want to drive, I'm not factoring in how it feels to get hit by it. <laughs> I think that's, that's a dangerous <laughs> thing to be taken into account. Yeah. Going, oh, why do you want to buy this car? Well, I just think if I get hit, I won't hurt as much. I mean, that's a dangerous thing mm. to be thinking. Yeah, but like... I, I, want, I want to take your licence off you now. That's really worrying. <laughs> no, but, but... Or maybe it's the other way around. Maybe it's because I'm, you know, very... have a lot of empathy with the, the normal... When the people you're running down. Yeah. I'm you're like, oh, if I hit them, whoa, you know? Because um, how, how about you just don't hit them one time? I'll try not to. Be, yeah. As I say, this is the fastest car I've gotten. And well, I, I don't do, think you should have it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not. But as I say, there's a scratch down one side, and there is a child's handprint uh, just next to the scratch. Oh. Um, and that is from a previous owner. I swear that's this is this is, this is not evidence that can be used against me. Right. It's from a <laughs> it's from like a, a two or three year old kid. He's got a handprint right. on on the door. Yeah. And I'm like. It's a bit dark, isn't it? Like, you know, there's a big scratch as well. It could be a tooth mark all the way to the end, but uh, no. Wow. One of the fingers has been rubbed out because the guy who I took the tooth... That's terrifying. It's a bit weird. I wasn't... It's like something out of a uh, ghost or something, you know, some sort of, like, ghost haunting thing as a child's handprint. Yeah, have you been haunted recently by children? No, which is good. No, no. Not the car that. is not haunted. The they're, car is... they're on the way, I think. I hope I don't have kids of any kind on the way. Uh, that, I, don't, I don't want. I don't want ghost kids or or real kids. Would you that rather have fine. a ghost kid or a real kid? I would rather have a ghost kid for sure. Okay. Because then I can. I can't be. Uh, I don't have to pay maintenance to it all or anything like that. That's good. That's fair enough. Not, um, not yet. They don't. They don't have your you future children listen to this? Future children. Yeah. No. Do you ever want kids? No. Never. No. Good, right choice. No, I don't. A, a comedy is the only child that I have at the moment, and I'm nurturing it to uh, to maturity. <laughs> Until death. <laughs> Until death. Until death. And the difficulty is, if you're going to draw an analogy between yeah. children and comedy... That means you have to wait at least 21 years until you see a proper return on your investment. Yeah. Which is a long time. Yeah, maybe. Well... Depends. Depends on what country you go to, isn't it? It'd also mean the first three years of doing comedy, you just clean up shit and vomit. <laughs> well, and that is, that, to be fair, that's quite close to comedy sometimes. Yeah. And some of the gigs you play, isn't it? The real rough ones. Ghost children. Or the children you've killed in your car. Yeah, but like, oh no, if you move countries. Yeah. Right? You get away with murder. No, yes, that too. Right. But if you move countries, I will get a bigger investment back on the children because I can send this work as soon as they're like five or. Or six. I mean, that's not yeah, bad. That's I've nearly hit the five or six year mark now, so that's fine. Yeah, that's not you bad. Can, there you go. You can nearly earn two pounds an hour. <laughs> or they can make my clothes. Hey, that's an investment. Yeah, that is an investment. That, that is an investment. And they'll just get better at it as they go. You know, and they can make it. That's it. 
Is yeah. that get them a nice carpentry course or a plumbing course or electrician course? Yeah. Electrician will leave out the electrician because, you know, that's probably a bad idea. Why? <laughs> you can't put to work in everything. You I know, you can, but they should uh, do all of these courses <laughs> at once. <laughs> you know, you, there must be. You need, I mean, I've got to have some sort of ethics. You know, I, I mean, no, don't. But you, don't, you haven't had so far. You've got well, a car true, with a dead child. Electricity, in it. electricity. You know, they could burn the house down. You know, they can't really. Okay, they, they might. Any damage they do to themselves with a sewing machine is just on them, isn't it? Really, they're not gonna. They can't sew the house down, can they? I don't know if if. if they're, they're children of yours, so they've probably got some sort of superpower. I think I probably where they could sew the house down. The thing is, I, I've been thinking, I've been uh, thinking this all wrong. I think like, I've been thinking about having just one child. Oh. I think I need more than one child potentially. But if you have five, that's five times the profit. I wonder how many children I can fit into this room. I could f- probably fit about twelve. Hey, look, 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 no, probably more than that. Like you know, with sewing machines included. Well, when you say fit them in the room, are they stacked on top of each other? Oh, that's a good idea. We could split level this thing, couldn't yeah, we? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because they're only little, aren't they? And they could just crawl in the little space. Yeah, yeah, you could just push them in. Yeah, I could I could create little holes in the wall for ventilation. Yeah. Um, that'd be good. I hope the um, RSPCA aren't listening. Are they the children one? I don't really know. Or care. This is probably never going to... They're never going to hear this, I'd say. <laughs> probably fit about at least 50 kids in this room, couldn't we? <laughs> you know? I mean, that... Uh, Oh my god. Yeah, that's 25, 25 per per level. This is the sequel to Daddy Daycare, we were all looking forward to it. <laughs> but, I mean, hey look. You're man. the new Eddie Murphy. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want kids. I mean, I don't, I don't, <laughs> I don't, want, I don't want kids, and there's like enough 50 of them. It's, and and they can make them work. work. <laughs> totally. It's not going to be all or nothing with you, is it? Yeah. You've got zero kids or 50 of them in a room. But then I'll have to feed them. Well, I could get one of them. Well, I could just get a couple of them to cook, couldn't I? Yeah. You know, look, if they're making clothes, I need someone to, someone to cook. Yeah. Cook for the rest of them. Hey, hello. Yeah, we need to get this sorted out. It'd be like a little barracks in the end, wouldn't it? Yeah. A little kind Very of... Very nice. Yeah, that'd yeah, be good. jobs, they can... Yeah. One could do the washing. Hey, it's like it's like the new apprenticeship schemes for, for kids these days, isn't it? It is just like that. That's yeah. what I could do. I could get all the apprenticeships <laughs> uh, down here, little sewing apprenticeships. Yeah. And then, you know, everyone's a winner. The government... You know, the kids, they're learning a skill. Hey, look. I mean, yeah, the, the, the children are winners in the eyes of the Tory government. Being a winner is definitely relative, isn't it, Tom? Yeah, they're, they're, they're <laughs> winner in the eyes of anyone who cares for human rights, but mm. the Tory government don't, so everyone's happy. We've, we've uh, stumbled onto a, uh, an economic gem. Yeah. I think we're, we're on the way. Yeah. On the way to helping this economy out. Finally, someone's going to exploit child labour. <laughs> About time. <laughs> this is it. <laughs> you know, if you can't beat them, yeah. <laughs> put them to work. Yeah. <laughs> or do both to force them to work. That's what uh, the, uh, the China's economy is built on. Exactly. Isn't it? Yeah. Ah, good times. Yeah, so you're living at home. Uh, yeah. what, what do your parents do then? I'm you're living at home though, you're living at home, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, well, they don't have very glamorous jobs. Like, my, my mum just works in boots. Oh, that's good. Chemist, and yeah. she also works in the playgroup. Mm. Helping out little, little children. A bit like what mm. you're going to do, but with less yeah. slave labour. Yeah. Um, oh, I think right. they do play cooking and stuff. Okay. So, in a way, they're getting trained up to work yeah. in one different and just work. work uh, warehouse. Yeah, the, the, yeah, just a you know little the the, the course. The, yeah, yeah, yeah. So they're on the way. Guinness um, course, yeah. I'm not saying I should get a cut, but I should get a cut. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. And my dad just sort of works in like drinks distribution. All oh, right. You don't have um, what kind of drinks? An alcoholic beverages. Oh yeah, what what, what kind? Uh, what different kind? All different kind. Yeah, like delivering them in lorries to pubs. We're not we're not we're not a showbiz family. Oh, that's all right. No, that's <laughs> we're all pretty um yeah. Lower middle class and mm. or upper working class, whichever way you want to spin it. Really, it's weird, isn't it? It's weird. This class thing, isn't it? You know. Yeah, it's weird because I, I, I kind of I've had like a middle class edu- education mm. in, in a middle class town, but very much grown up with working class values. Mm. So I kind of consider myself either lower middle class or upper working class. Mm. It's hard to know which way to spin it. Yeah, and what do you feel? What class? What do you feel? Yeah, I probably feel more working class. Mm. Mm. Just because. I don't know, like we didn't, well, it's, not, it's not like we grew up in poverty or anything, mm. but at the same time, mm. we always had a, there was lots of stuff we didn't have, you mm. know, we never had Sky TV, we, we rented our house, when mm-hmm. lots of friends at school would own their house and stuff like that, um, and it, they, they weren't, you know, I'd never had a sort of upbringing where they'd go 
oh, here's five grand, you can go to uni. Mm. It looks like if you want to go to uni, you're going to have to get a grant, you're going to have to get a job and earn money, you know. That's it. Um, which has probably, probably been really useful for comedy because it means I've got a lot more drive and mm. I'm happier, well, I'm, I'm fairly happy. Easy, to... easy, calm down now. No, no, no. Don't no. ruin the act. I'm not happy. <laughs> I'm, I'm very upset. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I, I'm sort of, um, it's not too much of a strain on me to work for free or work for mm. little money or do stuff because it's kind of, I've come from very humble beginnings, mm. so I'm sort of like, that's, that's fine. Whereas there's some people who are like, I've always had stuff given to them, and they're like, what, do a gig for free? No, yeah. I'd never do that. Mm, yeah. It's like, well, no, you need to yeah. work your way out from the bottom. So it. it kind of, it's given me that um, mentality where I'm sort of like, no, I'm happy to start from the bottom and work mm. my way up and... Appreciate everything that's given to exactly, you. Exactly, yeah, I've always had that sort of attitude where everything we've got has been like, oh, I appreciate that, that's nice. That's it, working hard for it, that's it, it gives you a nice chip on the shoulder as well. Exactly, yeah, it. yeah, exactly. That's it. That's it. I mean, I, I went to college in Wolverhampton is where I went, and I was like, had a, had like three jobs, you know. I yeah, like, yeah. worked in a bar, and like, I, I uh, worked in, I worked in two bars. And then I worked in like a gym in the day as well. Wow. So my weekends were just like taken up. I was like when yeah. I was in, in college and stuff and every, or extra shifts and, and all that. And then everyone's like, come out. I was like, no, I've got, I've got to work. Because yeah. when, I, when I went to uni in, in Wolves, the uni had answered a question they'd answered wrong on, on the form. So I didn't get a, a grant from, from Ireland or anything like that. Really? So I was stuffed. Oh, but man. actually I was screwed for like three years, you know. Yeah. And, uh, and that was it, man. I was like, I was on my ass. But it was just like, hey. But it's, it gives you like that. I say that drive, that motivation. Yeah, for that, that's, and, and you know, right? Okay, I've got to do this, do this, this, and you know, get all the stuff out of the way. Yeah. And you know, do as best you can. Growing up uh, in Tring, and did you find that that was you, all your friends around you were the same, or did you feel like the outsider of the group, or did you feel any any bit different to that? No, I think there was. Um, well, in, in terms of that like, class mm. wise, there was sort of a mix. I would say there was some that. Um, because you just meet at school, you just meet people who you think are nice and you get on with, you know. Mm-hmm. There was some, there's maybe like, there's probably like three of us who were probably would consider ourselves working class and mm-hmm. three who were like middle class, so it was probably that sort of split, you mm-hmm. know. Um, so it, it, it wasn't like, there was never anything like, oh, you can't afford that, oh, you're, you know, everyone was just like, no, let's just take the piss about football or something, you mm-hmm. know. It was never any tension or anything mm-hmm. like that, you just, part of you is a bit aware of, Oh, that person's got a really big house and their yeah. parents own it. <laughs> <You know? laughs> but that's at the it. same time, you're sort of like, well, that's how it is. Yeah, that's just how it's it like, is. Oh, you went on a skiing holiday. Okay, what's that like? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think we never went on holidays abroad. Mm-hmm. I've, I've only been to like, Ireland. That's it. Mm-hmm. Never been abroad. What part did you go? Uh, Dublin. Oh yeah. Yeah. Do you know it? I do. I do. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's quite famous. <laughs> it's, yeah, yeah. I lived in Dublin for two years. Oh, yeah, did you? Yeah. yeah. Oh, nice. And uh, I um, and uh, what part of Dublin do you go? Just um, around Temple Bar and that as well, or? I would, I'd be lying if I knew it specifically, oh, right. I didn't, but it was just Dublin, it was just, mm. we, didn't, we just had some people who used to live across the road from us. Oh, right, that's good. Cool. Some neighbours who used to babysit when we were growing up. Oh, nice. But yeah, that was really nice, Dublin, it was mm. really lovely, isn't it? Mm-hmm. It's beautiful. Oh, Dublin. <laughs> <laughs> bit, All the fun we had. A bit of an Irish reverie there. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, were you old enough to have Guinness, or did no, you drink much? No, I wasn't old enough to have Guinness when we went. Um, do you drink that much anyway, Tom? No, not massively. Mm. I'll drink socially every now and then, or if it's... It's that weird thing at, at, at gigs. If it's a, a venue where their rules are like, you have to buy a drink, I really resent it. Mm. But if it's just like a nice chilled out venue when they're friendly, like mm. um, like Arch One at um, G&B, for mm-hmm. example, which is just... Is that know, still going now? Is oh, it? it's got flooded, so yeah, they've, they've got a campaign to try and get the money back mm. to reopen. They're hoping to reopen in September. Uh, for those who don't know, it's a really nice venue in West Ham, like below an archway of mm. railway track. Is that oh, yeah, right? That's right, yeah. And it was like run by just an independent, an independent man. It was just his business. So I'd always buy a drink there because you feel mm. like you're supporting local business. Yeah, you're not supporting a Westspoons or a horrible pub who were like, we need to make this money to mm, do the mm. gig. You're just supporting a guy who's doing it for the love of it. So mm. I always would be happy to buy a drink there. Mm. But I'm not a huge drink. I've never really. Um, being a boozy, to, like, mm. you know, it's never really been a thing for me, um, which yeah. is probably a good thing because it's quite expensive and it kind of fucks your liver. <laughs> totally, yeah. I'd rather not, not do that. It's not the most healthy pastime, you know, no, it's mentally not. or or physically in any way. No, it's you know, it's it's something that's fun to do every now and then. And you got and you got your mom who works in boots. 
all the prescription drugs you can exactly, ever want. Exactly. So, so, what do you need I'm, that for? I'm sold. <laughs> and again, my dad t- delivers alcohol. There you go. So you don't just go out drink, do you? Yeah, you give it a free, it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> do you drink a lot. Do you have brothers? I have one brother. Oh, yeah. He's older than me, he's 27, and he lives in Nuneaton. Nuneaton? Yeah. This is a weird place to live. What's he living there for? He's got a missus. Yeah, he's where his girlfriend lives. Oh, right. He's older than you? Yeah, yes, yeah. By how much? Four years. All oh, right. Yeah. Good gap. It is good. It, it's it's the right gap that we could still get on growing up. Mm-hmm. You know, we, yeah. It's not too big. Yeah. You, you can see. occasionally win in the the, the the play fights. Every now and then, yeah. yeah if you um, use the right move that you copied off the rock from wrestling or something. Yeah. A yeah, tombstone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just <laughs> capture with a tombstone or... Yeah, close the line on occasion. We wasn't expecting it to come yeah, down the yeah. stairs. Just maybe a people's elbow in the morning when mm-hmm. you're asleep, whatever. Yeah, yeah, that's cool. Do you drink a lot then? Because you're, you're, you're Irish and the stereotype is uh, all I, you do is drink, apparently. I honestly have done most of my drinking when I was younger, when I was, like, in my teens. That makes sense. And I really got it out of the way. Yeah. I remember the first thing I ever drank was a bottle of vodka. And nice. Yeah, that was when I was about, about 13, I think. 13, 14. I remember drinking at the graveyard as you would, you know, that's where you would go to drink. Wow, you know, you classic, it. stereotypical, yeah. I know. It was at Halloween and like I saved up for like I saved up for, for yunks to get That's this. weird, because on Halloween you'll be drunk, so you'll be thinking you'll seen things. But it's just people in masks. Yeah. You'll be like, Oh what I saw a werewolf or something there but there was a werewolf there. I'll tell you what, tell you what I saw. What? Uh, the floor mostly. Nice. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we made the most of it at Halloween. Uh, I, I remember there was a, what was it? There was a, uh, yeah, we got this bottle of vodka and like everyone's like, oh, here we will pass it. It was about five of us. Yeah. And passing around, it was two, two, three girls, I think, and then I think three lads. And. You can't remember clearly. No. Clearly. Well, like, I remember the start of the night and it was the graveyard and we're drinking this thing and everyone's like, oh, there was no mixer or anything to mix it with. Nice. And so it was like a big bottle, like, you know, uh, big, four ECL. Oh. And, uh, and I was like, and I was like, oh, and everyone was like, no, we're not, I'm not going to drink this. They said to me, I was like, hey, I've, I've paid, a, it's a tenner. A tenner was a lot of money. That's you know? a lot of money when you Oh, know. mate, when that I was 30, I was like, well, this is big money here. And so I was like, well, I'm not going to waste it. Yeah. So I necked like about three quarters of the bottle of vodka, not realising what it could do to me. And then was everyone was like, oh, yeah, we've got a few pints down, down the street. And I was like, okay. And then I started walking back and I felt this wave of, of numbness hit my feet. And then... As soon as it hit my head, wow. I couldn't walk anymore. Yeah. I was like, knockout. And then and then all I saw, not masks, but I saw the floor, all I smelled was cheeseburgers and nice. coffee. You know, you know, like, you know, like that, that typical kind of thing when someone's drunk in a film. You yeah. know, you see like comes things, things come in and out of focus, like cheeseburgers yeah. and coffee. And then I finally sobered up because I, every time they held me up, I'd fall down, like, just completely on the yeah. box. And then... I got to the disco, the kids' disco, which was what the night I was supposed to be out, right? Kids' disco. Yeah, kids' disco. I was drunk. Mate, I was twatted. Um, and they, they, there was nothing to do in the town, though. So, so they went... Um, really? They were really <laughs> wasn't. Drunk in a graveyard. Mate, honestly, it was ridiculous. So, so they picked me up and they took me to the, the front of the disco. And the two of my friends held me up. And the two boys who were the bouncers were like, have you been drinking? And I was like, no. <laughs> So it's so, like stinking of alcohol, must have been. And then they, they, they had to let go of me because they couldn't carry me in. So I tripped over my feet and landed head first on the, the, the step. I managed to get up and then ran in. The disco was like, back then, you could smoke inside. Oh, and, like, so, and it was filled with smoke. And so that extra uh, smell of tobacco yeah. just made me so ill. So yeah, I kind of, I've been through my, there's more mental things happened to me, but I've been through my mental times, you know, rather than, I don't really do that much. Again, too old for it. I don't have the money. You know, yeah. I'd rather just gig. You know, I'd rather just inflict psychological pain on me, yeah. on, on myself that lasts a hell of a lot longer. You know, and, and you know, good gig, great. You're you know you're euphoric for days. Bad gig, you're just you're miserable and depressed for until the next gig that goes well for a lifetime. Yeah, and you can just like constantly just keep poking and picking yeah. that scab. Yeah, you know, it's like oh oh that was so bad. Yeah, I know. Do you want to feel that again? Because, you know, you could, in the end, you become numb to everything. You know why you turn into Batman there? I don't know why. Batman stole my mojo. Comedy. The Joker. What's that all about? <laughs> <laughs> but, but Batman is tortured, and so am I. And mm-hmm. Batman has bad nights as well. You know, he gets yeah. the shit beaten out of him. He got his yeah. back broken, didn't he? He did, yeah. Yeah. What bad gig that was. That's it. I mean, you know, he, Bad gig last night. Got my oh. back broken. <laughs> so it's hard. It is. Especially with a broken back. And your Batman as well. Yeah. That's it. But he always wears a mask on stage, doesn't he? 
He does, yeah. Which is perhaps a shtick, isn't it, really? It's not really showing who he really is. No, that's true. But, yeah. So I don't really drink milk, but I just drink tea now, which is the, the destroyer of bladders. Tea's nice. I do like tea, tea a lot. Tea is the tea. drink of champions. Not as bad as alcohol, I don't yeah. think. Yeah. Kidneys. Is your kidney all right? I think I think both kidneys are good, yeah. No, okay, you do a fine then. I've got two kidneys, it's good. It's good. <laughs> Double of fun? Yeah, this is it. You know, it uh, takes two tango. <laughs> No one's never said that about kidneys before in the I mean, maybe history of maybe. humanity. Tango's just sugar, mate. That's all it is. Yeah, it is. It Co- is coke less of sugar. It's the ridiculous thing. Like I, I very rarely drink coke, but mm. maybe like once a month I'll have a coke. Yeah, every time I'm like, why am I drinking this? Cause mm. You know it's just like sugar and water. That's all it really is. It's so unhealthy, but... It's, it's, got, that addic- it's got that addictive quality. Mm. And the marketing's so vivid that... It's really difficult not to do. It's that's the thing. It's like that's what I'm trying not to do now. I'm trying not to be swayed by that much it's by advertising. I'm trying yeah. not to watch like even with Facebook. I'm like, like oh, okay, yeah, fine. Yeah, like, not not looking at that much. Yeah. Just want to keep in the in the in the, the tracks of what you're supposed to do. You yeah, know? yeah. Because uh, otherwise, you, like you know, you turn the internet on, you go, I'm supposed to do something, and yeah. now I have no idea what I'm supposed to do. Yeah. There are two of the things that want me to do things right now that I'm just frozen. And you end up saying, oh, I think what I'm supposed to do is play Pokemon Go for four hours. Have you been doing that as well now? I've not, I've not. I don't know why I haven't done that either. I sort of grew up with Pokemon. I do really like Pokemon, but it's the type of thing I want to, I'll download it and get into it once Mm. everyone else has stopped playing it. Because when it's something that's on an internet server that's really unreliable because too many people are using it, Mm. I just think give it three months, most people have moved on. Mm. You can just enjoy it at your own pace. This one guy quit his job to catch them all or some bullshit like that. Is that probably just a publicity stunt of some kind? That sounds it? like some sort of marketing yeah, stunt. Yeah, it's like, come on, really? That's more like I was slightly tapped in the head if he did that anyway. Yeah. yeah. I mean, how is he going to afford to be able to catch them all? He's going to charge his phone. Yeah. That's it. He's going to run yeah. out of money. Madness. Can never catch them all. And then people coming back from holiday going, oh, I found a different, a weird Pokemon. Yeah, well, congratulations. One of my favourite things is just yesterday I was talking to a friend and he was like, Oh, I've got a funeral to go to. Be like, oh, but, but the thing about the funeral is, is that a church that is a pokey stop. So he was looking forward to a funeral because he can get some more pokeballs. That's one way to look at a funeral, isn't it, really? Yeah. I guess it helps stay happy and enthusiastic. <laughs> yeah. I wonder if you like that into his, you know, eulogy. Yeah, I've, I've, I've already posted it on Twitter. You know, Pokemon Go has put the fun back into funerals. Yeah. Because now yeah. people are going, can't wait for that funeral to get more pokeballs, which is ridiculous. Yeah, yeah. they're everywhere. So do you not you don't play much games then? I play video games. What do you play? I've got a PlayStation 3, uh, oh, yeah. Nintendo 3DS. I like nice. those. Do you play Nintendo much? No, I'm an Xbox dude. I can say you're Xbox, Xbox right over there. And I'm hitting the, uh, that's like The Walking Dead. Oh, I see. But, like, what games do you play with the P- PS3? Uh, I play FIFA quite a lot, so I like oh, football. Yeah. Do you like football? Mm, not a big fan, to be honest. Uh, okay. No. Well, well, I like it. <laughs> <laughs> I will lose. Very few people who do like football. Yeah, but very rare you'll meet one of us. Yeah. yeah. Um, but no, I, I like FIFA. I like. Um, who do you support? Chelsea. All right. But like, I, I've talked about this with uh, I talked about this with Bonjo as well, right? President Bonjo. Press, sorry, excuse me, President Bonjo. I've talked about this um, with. Get yeah, it right, or he'll shoot you. You know, I was talking about like has comedy changed him? Mm. Uh, what about you? How has comedy changed you? Yeah, I think so. Mm. Um, I mean, not wanting to go back onto like topics of um, you know different groups and diversity and stuff, but it has made me hang around with lots of people from far different backgrounds than I would anyway. Like, mm. I mean, how old are you? You're in your thirties, are you? Yeah, I'm thirty-five. See, so yeah, I'm here recording the podcast with a 35-year-old guy, which I probably wouldn't be doing if I didn't do comedy. I just have all friends my own age from school. Mm. Um, I know people like Abonjo, who's he's a guy in his 50s, mm. he's from Nigeria. I know people from all sorts of different backgrounds. Mm. I wouldn't have bumped into it if I just sat at home playing FIFA every day. Mm. <laughs> so you do sort of learn about all sorts of different people. You meet all sorts of people from different backgrounds, and it... it, it makes you grow as a person by meeting them and learning about their lives and... Yeah, it does make you, it widens your head, it makes mm. you more, um, not open-minded, but it makes you more aware of everything, sort mm. of in a way, you know. Mm-hmm. You, you learn, you you know, you evolve as well with yeah, them. Yeah, exactly. And yeah. You learn from other people's experiences as well. And 
Mm. Most of it comedy has probably made me far more adept socially than I was. Mm. I've always sort of been quite the a quite awkward guy at school. Never really spoke to many people. Mm. As comedy, I sort of had to force myself to talk to people I didn't know, whether it was a promoter or a gig or a comedian. I had to sort of really force myself to be like, "Hey, you're all right. I'm I'm in the bill." Mm. And so it sort of helped me in that way, just speaking to far more strangers than either I would have if I was at home mm. or I'd usually be comfortable with because you have to speak to so many people you don't know in comedy mm. which is it's sort of weird when you think of it like people with a, a, a normal lives they could go a year and sort of speak to like maybe 10 new people or mm. something like some people they're a bit introverted and they don't go out much mm. people do comedy you you speak to hundreds of new people sometimes in it, well, first the audience, there's hundreds of new people in a night sometimes, but mm-hmm. just off stage, you speak to hundreds of new people in a year, mm-hmm. you, you meet so many people, which is kind of part of the privilege of it, really, mm-hmm. that you wouldn't have if you didn't do it, because you'd be sat at home, playing FIFA, eating crisps, <laughs> and that would be your life. <laughs> Becoming more and more socially awkward. Yeah. Um, uh, because, like, since I've known you, Tom, you have become more sociable any- anyway. Like, the first time I met you, like... Yeah even more socially introverted now, yeah, you seem yeah. to come out yourself an awful lot. Mm. I mean, you won the King Gun. Oh, right? I did, yeah. Well, congratulations. Sure. Thank, yeah. You. Thank you. And uh, things are opening up for you a little bit as well. You need to get two to the finals of the Moose Moose, is that right? No, semi-finals, mate. Sorry, semi-finals. Sorry, sorry semi-finals. Well, I didn't put me through to the final, so enter again next year. Oh, but semi-finals is good, right? Yeah, I'll have semi-finals. Happy with semifinals, put, on, put it on the CV, off you go. Yeah, yeah, I was happy with that. Yeah, that's great. I want to get to a final. Have you got to any finals? I got to a final recently. Which final? Um, it was Stand Up for Cider. How'd it go? It was, uh, it was fine, yeah, it was good. I mean, as I got through to the finals, I was like, and uh, put a finalist on the uh, Yeah, of course. On yeah, the CVs. It's, it's always something, isn't it? You yeah, know? yeah. With your your act, you know, you, you become more confident. Yeah. And you find it difficult to hold the the, the persona <laughs> down. Is it, is it running away from you? Is it kind of going, oh man, I'm a little bit more confident now. Is this going to feel real because I mean you're, gonna, you're only 24 as well yeah. so, so are you going to constantly evolve or, or sorry are you going to become like Jack Whitehall in the end and go my dad's, the... my dad's not working telly as we've established and now oh, no, but no, no, Jack no. Whitehall <laughs> <laughs> no I know but like well, I'm, I'm, and that's not better just that's a bit of, a bit of, a, a bit of fun but... also when I look in the mirror I'm not Jack Whitehall so I'm no, not going to be Jack Whitehall no, but you know, you know like, <laughs> as I said, I've talked to a few people as well it's like how comedy's changed you yeah yeah right? and it's made you more confident and, ha- and happier I'm sure yeah, yeah. Yeah, and so, do you think that that is going to cause you to... Do this little hand thing I've got going on here? It's, it's very good. nice, yeah. It's good, isn't it? It's good. Sorry. It's is bad it? for the podcast. <laughs> Winter was doing something with his hand, I'm not going to say what. <laughs> we'll make your own conclusions at home. He wasn't touching himself, that is no, fine. No, wasn't. Um, but it was worse. Do you think that, do you think that, 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 that comedy, comedy's helped you, right? Become yeah, more yeah, sociable so, yeah, And more confident. Yeah. And is that going to become difficult with the person you are on stage now if you think it be- becoming genuine one of your bits i'm not going to do it but it's like you know it's about how you're alone yeah it's basically what it is yeah and it's all very that is the through line now isn't it and no, how, yeah, how you're I... alone and now you're you're successful like you know you're having some success tiny bit success. You're, okay you're having success yeah right? and which is great Oh, you, it, 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 well, no, I mean, I'm, no, fair, fair play, man. Okay. It's, any success is good, you know? Yeah. But you think that that through line is going to change and it's going to become difficult for you to nail down and it's going to run away from you? I, d- I don't, know. I think, um, I mean, first, maybe I should say, yeah, to, to, to summarise my act, like, I kind of, I've had to do it with Regra coming up, but I've kind of sort of nailed it down as, like, dark, self-deprecating jokes wrapped around an awkward, nervous persona. That's kind of what my act is. Mm-hmm. Um, I think, I don't think it will change it too much, because I'm still, uh, even if I did get huge profit, I'd still always be a bit awkward and mm. a bit odd, because that's always sort of the way I've been. And I also think that, like, originally I was awkward and nervous on stage just because I was awkward and nervous mm-hmm. and not very confident. Mm-hmm. Because now I'm sort of, it's weird, it's sort of, Awkward, but in a confident way. Yeah. Um, like the awkwardness is just—I don't know. <laughs> it's so weird, isn't it? It's such a weird thing to describe, though, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. You're yeah. Awkward in a confident way. It's like, oh, thank God, I'm weird. Well, isn't no. It? No, I mean, I mean, like that's—I mean, that's, I mean, that's me. Mm. But, that, but like, you know, you're you're yeah. reveling in the the abstract. You know, yeah, oh, yeah. I'm abstract. Thank God, I'm weird. Oh, yeah. guys, you know, finally, you you don't think what? No, I don't think it's going to. Um, 
made me have to completely <laughs> change the act, basically. I think, I think the, the, um, without getting too morose, I think the, the core sadness is still there when <laughs> That's exactly how I feel about my act. <laughs> yes, yeah. I think the, um, it's like sometimes I thought, well, if I, if I went out with someone, would that ruin the act? It's like, well, mm. probably wouldn't, because I'd still have crippling self-esteem issues. <laughs> Exactly. Exactly. Um, Why else would we do this? Exactly. Yeah. It's, I, I asked the same thing to another character actor said, and, and they were like, "No, it, it it hasn't. It hasn't. Has it? Has it changed me?" But I think in the years that you go through it, there's a, a certain amount of self-esteem that you you know you gather from doing comedy, and then you get topped up. Yeah. And then you that bit of self-esteem, no matter how limited it is and how difficult it is to to hold on to from yeah. gig to gig. You grow and develop, and you and you your whole act it does develop a little bit. You get a bit stronger, and you can follow mm. it a bit further. And then, can, once you've you've got it nailed down, you can follow the darkness fully to the end of it. Yeah, you know, and, and then you can you know you're going the right you're on the right path, and yeah. you can say yes, this is this is the correct path, and this is where everything is going to come from. I think it's yeah, it's sort of the type of thing that like um, saying is success going to ruin your act if your act's quite sucked mm. up. Game. It's a bit like saying you know if. <laughs> if you suddenly met the person of your dreams and became a millionaire, would your depression go away? Yeah, that's right. I mean, it's, it's like, just like yeah. Stephen Fry. Yeah. Sort of like he's got a lot of money, he's done very well, but he's still got he's clinically depressed. Mm. He's, you know. Yeah. I think it, it's always going to be there. Yeah, um, I'm never going to be Jack White, and I wouldn't want to be Jack White. So, mm-hmm. uh, to clarify that point <laughs> further. <laughs> Um, better or worse yeah yeah well Very different isn't it you, yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you've got his thing you've got your thing for me personally the the inner hatred will always be there for for me you know yeah, yeah. Kind of, there's always that self-doubt or a self-loathing that will always be bubbling inside no yeah. matter what happens to, to to my act or or to my career it'll always be keep picking that scab yeah. to, for inspiration forever because that's what everything comes from isn't of course, it yeah, and it's, yeah. it's weird because like when you when you were younger, you would look at confident kids like the Jack Whitehall of the school, and you'd think, I want to be like them. Like, mm-hmm. when I was, like, six, when I was, like, 18, doing some of my first gigs, I was sort of thinking, I wish I had the confidence of someone like, I don't know, Russell Brand on stage. Mm-hmm. It was only until you get a bit older, you get a bit more used to your own skin, mm-hmm. that I'm far happier with the self-doubt and the self loathing than if I was some egomaniac who was mm-hmm. massively confident. Mm-hmm. You're, I'm far more confident, not confident, but more comfortable having that in there. Mm. And you're like, no, I'm, I'm, I'm fine with that. I can still get by with that. You know, mm-hmm. it's not making me have to stay at home and not live a life. I'm, mm. I'm perfectly happy with that. I'm sort of used to it, and it's fine. And it's honest as well. Yeah, of course. And yeah, it's yeah. nice that you found that honesty. Yeah. Because you're young. You know, yeah. you find it, it doesn't it doesn't often come until later on. But yeah. you're like, okay, I know me, yeah. and then you're putting that out there, which is really good. Yeah. Uh, and it's it's a, it's a, it's, a, it's true. It's you, and it's and it's just something everyone can relate to, no matter how old you are. Yeah. Because you are always going to have doubt, no matter who it is, going to have doubt. Yeah, of course. And self-loathing right. about something could be the most minute thing, mm. and that's that's a great thing, and that's what uh, media is promoting. So we're always going to have self-doubt. Yeah. Is media is the new uh, promoter of of what was before Catholic guilt? Because religion has gone in the toilet. So much to feel miserable about. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I mean, your act is never ending, is it? It's a very cheery podcast. This is great. This is, oh, well, it's honest, though, isn't it? I mean, it's, it's, yeah. it's just, it's true. I mean, yeah, it's the type of thing that um, it's it's always going to be there. It's mm. not like even if you're really successful, you're still going to have stuff out about lots of things because. Mm. It's just the way I've always been, you know. <laughs> you know, literally, you know. And, and Tom, the wonderful thing is, you haven't even reached 30 yet. No. You look at all these problems you've got to, to face in the future. Oh, I can't wait, mate. Mate, you've got fringe shows just lining up there. Yeah. There's queues of stuff, hours and hours of uh-huh. material you can draw from. I can't wait. It's going to be really yeah. exciting. I mean, you could get married as well, you know. That, that'd that be great. I mean, statistically, that's not likely. Why, why is that? Based on the number of people I've dated them for how long I've dated them in my life. Well, it could be a shotgun wedding, you never know, you could get both of those things at once. Well, that's a really positive, <laughs> positive view of my future. Well, we're in Dublin. On the, on the plus side, Tom, you could get a shotgun wedding. <laughs> Great, can't wait. You know, just, you've got to be careful, you've got to be careful, that's all. I'm trying to avoid it. Marriage and children aren't really things I've ever really aimed for, to mm. be honest, in my life. Like, everyone was like, oh, like, that's something where, like, when they're 14, like, 
I want to have a wife and two kids. And I was like, what? Mm. What? 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 Why? Mm. Why? Mm. I just... Again, it's the programming, isn't it? It's yeah, like, yeah. Oh, okay, what, what's up? Adrian's supposed to have this? I'll go with this age. Okay. I've always kind of rallied against that. So I've just been like, no, I don't want kids. I'll just do what I want, thanks. Mm. I'm miserable enough at the moment, thank you. Yeah. I don't need to add that into my life. You know, I don't need to share this misery with anyone. This is all my misery. Well, how can you, when you're 14, be like... 14. I know I want that responsibility in the future to have a wife and two children. Mm. You, you can't have either the experience or the probably the intellect or the understanding to know that's what I want to do. But mm. it's so programmed mm. that you see four-year-old girls who are pushing around little mm. toy babies and mm. it's so programmed mm. that people don't even realise the magnitude of it before they've decided oh I want to do it with my life yeah pushing around those sport those those babies when they should be making them exactly, I mean like yeah. you know in a little you know like <laughs> one of my favorite. those little moulding factories that's what they should be I was once in a um a hospital waiting room not for anything serious it was fine okay. but I, I was watching um this this little kid was there with her mum mm-hmm. and there's those little um eager little, little plastic um fruit and ovens and kitchen oh, areas yeah, yeah. and she had a little a baby doll like she put it in a plastic microwave, <laughs> waited 10 seconds, got it out, went, here you go, mummy, it's done. <laughs> that was brilliant. <laughs> yeah, and it was just so wonderfully dark, and yeah. the child had no idea how dark it was. I, I laughed for about 10 minutes. It's great, great. And what did mum say? <laughs> she went, oh, thank you very much, that's, that's lovely, dear, and don't do that again. <laughs> Baby in the microwave. Nice, nutritious meal, mate. High in protein. So, the child that young does not have the responsibility, mm. or <laughs> you know, they do not have the the mind to be able to decide they want to be a parent mm. if they want to then put a baby in a microwave. This is, this is true. Well, you do a podcast with Paul Foot as well, right? I do, yes, yes. The Paul Foot Podcast, oh, right. original title. Mm. Yes. And are you doing the, you're in that, you're co-host for that as well? I'm the co-host. I have been since January 2015. Oh, great. Yeah, it's mm. fun. It's, we, we release it quite sporadically. Mm. It's, like, occasionally we do seri- like, a series of six episodes so once a week we put out an episode mm. and it's, um, it's just very odd, as you'd expect. Mm. It's great. If you know if you know Paul's work, mm-hmm. it's just very weird and strange and silly and just sort of muck around and have a mm. laugh and it's good fun. Yeah. Yeah. Is it has it helped you with with writing? Like, you know, doing the the because Paul's quite abstract and you're quite surreal as well. In a sense I'm quite surreal, but I'm I'm also I'm not sure. My my I don't think it has helped in my writing to be honest. I've sort of What's helped in my writing is I giggle a lot. I don't mm-hmm. think a podcast necessarily has had any really impact on that. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously, knowing someone, I, what has helped more is sort of talking to Paul and him just being like, if I've had a bad gig, he's like, why well, mm-hmm. shit gig? Because I'm sort of not in this way, but sort of like, look at me now, sort of like everyone, just knowing that everyone, even some people who are really high up, were at our level at the mm-hmm. point, and they were having the same doubts, the same worries, the same fears, mm. you know, they were chasing the same dreams, mm. thinking, will it ever happen? And they just worked hard, and it did. It won't happen for everyone, but mm. for everyone who it does happen to, they started at the same point. Mm. And just sort of knowing that is sort of really comforting to know that, okay, it's not, I'm not the only one to have, have a shit gig at a gong show at mm. Pupter Creek or whatever, mm. you know, everyone else has had poor gigs somewhere or... And it's just about um, it's just about keeping going and mm. having the determination. That's kind of what's helped me more than. Mm. Um, I was just I mean I was just saying doing the podcast it might you know kind of open up some creative things let, letting loose and just being a bit weird with Paul you know having something to play play off. So yeah you you know you, you're seeing the the yeah. footsteps where he's tro- trodden and you yeah. go oh that's where I can go it's okay it's going to happen when it happens yeah well, yeah I don't think you know I, I wouldn't. I probably wouldn't, as I said, I wouldn't say it's necessarily impacted on my writing much, mm. but obviously having someone who's done very well in comedy, mm. who then obviously believed in you enough to be like, Great. I want you on my podcast, that's that's a huge confidence boost, because he, if, if I was crap, I wouldn't be on it, and he, he sort of said to me, he's like, if you weren't funny, you wouldn't be on it, and that's obviously really nice. Mm. Um, so, so yeah, that's it's more sort of that, and it's just, like that's helped with the confidence and the belief in my attitude that, okay, I'm, I'm doing all right, you mm-hmm. know, even if some months I might not have a paid gig in a whole month, it's still sort of going, and I'm going in the right direction. It's, it, there's, there's people who know comedy who like and respect what I do. Mm. Um, it's always the thing that when you do a, a gig with, 
you know, when the pro comedians mm-hmm. when they're seeing a competition or whatever, mm. or when they say something nice, it always means so much more because mm. obviously they don't have to say it. They're not trying to butter you up to work their mm. way out. They've made it, you know. Yeah. But also, it means they wouldn't say it if they didn't mean it because I see so many comedians that if they just say if they say something nice to you, it means they actually thought it was mm. of value and decent, which is always. You know, really lovely, isn't mm. it? Because there's so many gigs that can knock you down. Acknowledgement. Yeah. It means so much, doesn't it? Yeah, and, and it's, um, that's the thing, as you say, you do have to just grab and hold on to those successes because that's why people sort of say, oh, what's it like when you, d- you do a gig and no one laughs? And mm. if it's at the start of your career, it feels crap and it beats mm. you up and you kind of don't want to do it again. But once you've done, once you've got some successes <laughs> under your belt, like you're, yeah. you're standing at the side of final, people say to you, what happens when you don't get any laughs? It's like, well, that was all right, that happens every now and then, but I've got this to back me up to show that I'm good at it, so that's not going to knock my confidence because I've got this to prove that I'm all right, I'm doing well, you know. Mm-hmm. And it's those successes and those comments from peers who you respect or your fans of or whatever that keeps you going mm-hmm. and makes you think, actually, no, I've, there's something of value in this and people enjoy it, so I'm going to keep doing it. Mm-hmm. Okay, that moment when you're hitting, hit your no, you've done a couple of jokes and it's like, oh, shit, this is yeah. not going... Yeah. how it's supposed to and you realise I can't pull this around now yeah. I'm going to die <laughs> I'm, I'm, this is happening yeah. oh fuck it <laughs> and you know and, and you know yeah. and there's that moment and you're like oh. but whereas before at the start of your career you'd go oh fuck and, you, and then panic yeah. now do you find I find now personally when, when, when it's going badly I can just dig in yeah. and go you know what? It's all right. Yeah. Uh, this isn't my finest fucking hour, but it's okay. Yeah. I've got all that stuff we're talking about in the back pocket yeah. because I have done really well at gigs. Yeah. And this is just not my night. And you just and you can smile at that adversity and go. You sometimes take that joy and go. Oh, this is yeah, the time. Yeah. This is the time I'm gonna die. Oh, just just give it to me. <laughs> give me all of that pain. You've no idea how much I dislike myself. Yeah. The best of times, so you can't even <laughs> equate to how much how much self loathing I have. Yeah, exactly. So you're never gonna never gonna win it, no matter how many people are here. In your first twenty gigs, if that happened, mm. you just think, God, I'm shit, I'm awful, I'm gonna waste my time. But mm. now you can just be like, eh, well, this is going badly, isn't it? <laughs> 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 Make a mockery of the whole thing, yeah. and just enjoy it in yeah. a weird way. Oh, exactly, just. And the whole lads will go, oh, this is like a roller coaster of yeah. misery. Here we go. Oh, let's see how much further we can take it down. <laughs> <laughs> you know? and, then, and not that you're making it bad for them, but you, you know, they'll probably start to enjoy it then. But maybe they'll just be still pissed off with me by the end. But, but as you say, when you leave it all out there, like there's, you've got nothing left to give, well, then, there's, th- then you haven't lost because you've still fought. You know, you've, had, yeah. you've had a good death. Course, you've had yeah, a yeah. good death, and that is what we want, a you've good got, death. You've, you've died like a pro. You've yeah. actually died. <laughs> yeah, right, you went for it. It didn't matter if they liked it or not. You just went with the best you had, you know, yeah. and that's it, and you gave it everything. I think that's, but that's how life should be, isn't it, really? Just go yeah. for it. Like, and, and, and that's what I think the stand-up, I think, it kind of teaches you a bit about yourself and go, you know, that's it, hold on to it like a dog with a bone, yeah, and then correct. just don't, don't stop. That's it, man. I also think it's, um, obviously, as you said, it, there are external factors. Obviously, some comedians always blame the audience, which you shouldn't mm-hmm. do. They just, like, you know, have some self-awareness. Mm-hmm. But I also think it's important to remember, because people, some people sort of go, oh, I want to be the type of comedian who can play every room. Mm. There's no comedian who can do that without massively changing mm-hmm. even though I set on the persona like you yeah. put Stuart Lee in front of a room of Michael McIntyre fans mm-hmm. unless he completely changed his set which he wouldn't want to do because he's an artist mm-hmm. he would bomb at the same time Michael McIntyre in front of Stuart Lee fans he would bomb mm-hmm. so there's no comedian who can play every room sometimes mm-hmm. there is a room where I just hate you if, mm-hmm. you know as an Irish comic you do a room full of English people who mm-hmm. for whatever reason don't like Irish people mm-hmm. or you're a, a gay comedian and you're doing it in Texas or something, mm-hmm. they might just hate you. There's mm-hmm. nothing you can do about it. That's it. It's, I mean, it's, you kind of have to have the um, awareness that sometimes just being like, they just weren't going to like me. Mm-hmm. And they're just, they just don't like my face. Exactly, yeah. They just don't it like something, something, It could be that. They mm-hmm. might just not like people with brown hair. It could be... Yeah. It, it, or you know, you know, blue eyes or, or whatever it is. It's just, or, yeah. you know, it's one of those, or they don't like your shoes 
like yeah. even the class stuff as well. It's like sometimes oh, course, when, yeah. when when they hear an accent of some kind or like you know mm-hmm. not not an English accent, an Irish accent, I can feel sometimes uh, some very posh audiences go no, yeah, no, we don't want to hear this guy. No, we want we want someone who's who's obviously been brought up in a public school, uh, and we want to hear that guy. Well, it's you know, like um, he's not wearing a suit. What? It's like a, it's like an extreme example, but like King Kong, or sometimes people come and go, oh hi, I'm American. I just get carded mm-hmm. off. Straight away after. Oh that. really? Yeah, yeah. After like fifty, after ten seconds, I'm American. They're off mm. because the audience think that'd be a funny thing to do, mm-hmm. just because oh, we don't have <laughs> Americans. It'd be funny to get them off. Which, in a way, it's funny. You mm. can see why it's funny, but for that comedian, it's pretty shit. Yeah, totally. <laughs> but sometimes <laughs> you won't say that next time. But sometimes that is that's comedy. Sometimes, yeah. isn't it? You know, straight away, first impressions. If I don't like you, that's it. You're gone. Yeah, that's it, man. That's it. It's like rejection on a massive scale. <laughs> May we continue. <laughs> to be rejected and smile in the face of adversity. Yeah. But yeah. Well, Tom. Anyway, man. I'm, I think that's. Uh, I think we've come to the end of it already. Oh, have we? I think so. Um, what do we, we do now? Uh, what? Well, I don't know. I think we could. Uh, we could just talk about our misery a bit more if you want. It. Yeah, yeah. Let's um, just go take our meds. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you are. I say you can find you on the Paul Foot podcast as well. Yeah, the Paul Foot podcast. Listen to that. It's on iTunes and Podbean and mm. everywhere you'd want to find a podcast. Great. I'm on Twitter at Tom Mayhew ninety one. I'm on Facebook if you want to poke me. I don't know why you'd want to. <laughs> probably just annoy me, to be honest. Are po- people still poking people on Facebook these days? I, I'm, there's four people I'm still poking that I've poked like 500 times. Oh, right, that's, that's cool. And it's a real war of attrition, mm. and I don't know why it's happening, but it's never going to stop. Force of habit. It's an mm. obsession. Yeah. An unhealthy obsession. <laughs> and an utter waste of time. <laughs> Which Facebook is. Yeah. You know, so you're doing it ironically, which exactly. I like. I like exactly, that. Yeah. Good. But Tom, thanks for coming on the podcast. Right. Had a great time, yeah. Thank you for having me, man. That no, was good, man. And that was Tom Mayhew for episode 14. Go and see Tom live. He's very funny, very self-deprecating, different to normal, in-your-face kind of high-energy stuff, as I say. You'll really enjoy it. You will not be disappointed. Now, I, I say I don't have time to put any of my life in this. That's maybe a good thing for you guys. But hey, look, we will have some of that after I'm back in September. But we have a character act on the next episode of The Comedy Defect with the Reverend Henry King. Now, he's an actor, he's a YouTuber, he's a very funny character act, high energy. He sort of crosses the Reverend with a football hooligan. An interesting mix. I think you'll enjoy this. If you like this podcast, you can follow us on Twitter, and that is at The Comedy Defect. You can follow me, at Winter Phone Under. If you want to come see me live for my gig dates, you can find them on the internet at winterphonander.com. The next episode is with Reverend Henry King, and that's for episode 15. And the next time I speak to you after that episode, I will be married. So guys, if you want to donate to the podcast, you can find us on Patreon. Go to Patreon, type in The Comedy Defect Podcast. And you can find us there. You can donate as much or as little as you want. But if you can't kick something back to us, just leave us a nice review on iTunes or Podbean. That's it from me for now. We'll see you next time on the Comedy Defect Podcast. Mm-hmm.